Well, greetings and welcome back to the History of the Restoration Movement Archives. This is module number five, and in this module we will discuss a theological system known as Calvinism. Now, we're going to specifically discuss how this system affected the American religious landscape, both how it affected the Puritans and other separatist movements earlier in the settlement centuries uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, but we're specifically going to look at how by the late 1700s, early 1800s, what is often known as strict Calvinism is going to fall into a certain um, disfavor, at least among many of the more evangelistic uh, Protestants. And so we want to look at how this sets the stage for one of the more common things we see in Restoration Movement writings, which is an anti-Calvinistic bent. And so we want to look at what Calvinism is. We want to look at how it has changed and morphed over the nearly five centuries of ex its existence. And we specifically want to focus on what aspects of Calvinism did many of the early divines of the Restoration Movement, what didn't they like about Calvinism? So then, let us start with John Calvin himself. Um, Calvin is born in northern France in 1509, and being French, the, I guess, correct pronunciation for his name is Jean Covan, but for us here in English-speaking countries, John Calvin is the correct way to pronounce his name. Now, 1509 places Calvin relatively late in the grand scheme of reformers. And so it is fair to say that Calvin is a second generation reformer. By the time he has earned his law degree, uh, all of the major players in the Reformation, Zwingli, Luther, Menno Simmons, have already had brilliant writing careers they have already stood up to the Roman Catholic Church. In short, John Calvin is not really on the map until the Reformation is already a political and religious force to be reckoned with. Now, Calvin makes a very significant contribution to Protestantism, though. He is going to write Protestantism's first, what can be called, exhaustive or comprehensive systematic theology. And this book that he writes is known as the Institutes of Christian Religion, or often just abbreviated as the Institutes. Now, this is a large, massive work. And I'd just like to begin by noting that the Institutes of Christian Religion went through eight editions. The first edition came out in 1536. Its last edition came out in 1559. And this last edition was several times bigger than the first edition. And what this tells me is that John Calvin is always thinking his position. John Calvin did not magically come up with his ideas and boom, Calvinism is a fully formed idea. And so he is going to constantly be thinking Calvinism through throughout his life. And when Calvin dies, others will take his writings and they will continue developing Calvinism. So in short, Calvinism is not necessarily anything that you can tie directly to any one moment or any one particular thought in Calvin's life. It is always a work in progress. And for about, a, I'd say about half a century after Calvin's death, it's still a work in progress. Now, continuing on, because Calvinism is quite a bulky theological system. It deals with quite a lot of 
propositional statements about who God is and what God does. Um, one of the more famous mnemonic devices, things to help us memorize what this doctrine is about, is this acronym called TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And this is specifically an acronym that is used to help to briefly define Calvin's doctrine of election, salvation, and anthropology, meaning it helps to explain what God is doing when he is electing both the righteous and the unrighteous. Calvin's doctrine of salvation in that if you are going to be saved, here is the process that happens from a, we'll call it a God's eye perspective. And it deals a lot with what Calvin's view of anthropology, what Calvin thinks a human being can and cannot do. Now, these five points you'll probably have drummed into your head ad nauseum in a theology class. So I don't really want to belabor this too much, but it will be very necessary for this class if you at least have a grip on these five ideas because several of these ideas will come under fire during the late 1700s and early 1800s. Now, the first of these ideas, represented by the T in the tulip, is this idea called total depravity. Total depravity simply means that humanity is entirely broken and evil on its own. That a human being is totally depraved, not kind of partially depraved, not, you know, having a bad day depraved. We're talking about 100% evil. And because humanity is 100% totally depraved, a human being cannot please God, even if they wanted to. Additionally, because he is to mankind is totally depraved, and even the act of seeking God would be a sign of goodness or integrity, that would mean that mankind cannot even seek God of his own volition. Because his own volition is to be totally depraved. Or to be even more strong, totally evil. So, the you unconditional election basically starts to answer the question, well, how does this totally evil human being find salvation? And the answer is, God has to choose who is going to search for him, who is going to look to God for salvation. And since man can't do that on his own, God has to himself pick who is going to do it. And this is why it's called unconditional election, meaning that the human being has done nothing of their own accord to warrant getting picked. They are picked simply because God has picked them. No strings attached. Now, the L of the tulip is a interesting statement about the cross. It suggests that when Jesus dies on the cross, he doesn't die for all of humanity. He only dies for the sins of those who God has already elected, meaning there's a limited number of people that the cross applies to. Now, this may seem odd to most of us because most Protestants today, even if we are Calvinist, tend to have an idea that, well, we should at least still preach the gospel to everybody. We may, and this is largely based on the fact of, even if you allow that limited atonement exists, a human can never know who's been picked and who hasn't, and so we might as well preach it like anyone could respond. But if you do take limited atonement to its logical conclusion, it means that if a person hasn't been picked, there really isn't much good in preaching to them. The cross doesn't apply to them anyway. 
But there is one strong advantage of that, and that is a Calvinistic system is not a universalistic system. If the cross only applies to X number of people, then anybody outside of that numerical set can't go to heaven. And so one of the strengths of the TULIP system is that it is very strongly ununiversalistic. Now, the I goes really hand in hand with the U, irresistible grace. And by this, Calvin means that a person who has been elected, God himself will pull that person into a salvation experience. That this person, again, they're totally depraved. They can't do anything on their own, but they've been picked. And the cross applies to them. They are one of the limited few who will get grace. And so this grace must be irresistible. They can't fight it, even if they wanted to. Even if you said, God, I don't want to go to heaven, too bad. Grace will hit you, and you will cooperate. And finally, we have the P, the perseverance of the saints. And by this, Calvin means that once you have been irresistibly called into this state of grace, you will never fall out of this state of grace. It is perseverance for the rest of your life. Once you're saved, always saved. This is where this idea comes from. Now, this is an extremely potent thing that will really drive a lot of theology for about the next 200 years because it is a huge comfort to people. If I am on the receiving end of grace, and I am guaranteed I will never fall away from grace, suddenly a human being has a peace of mind that really bypasses all all of the things that, you know, nag a person in the back of their head otherwise. Is God mad at me? Did that sin offend God? Will God punish me because I did this? Well, if perseverance of the saints is true, then there's nothing you can do that will make God turn his back. You are one of the elect. You have the cross is applied to you. The grace is irresistible. You will persevere. So that is the TULIP acronym. And again, it will be a test question. So look for at least being able to say with a certain amount of clarity what these five ideas mean. And again, if, if you want a really quick summary, here is what it would sound like. Total depravity. Humanity is evil and incapable of seeking God on its own. Unconditional election. God picks people for heaven, and it is not based on their merits. Limited atonement. The cross event only applies to the elect, and not to human beings in general. Irresistible grace. Those who have been picked will find God's call irresistible, will not change, will not deny it, will not change around midstream. And finally, perseverance of the saints. A person who has been through this process will remain a saint for the rest of their life. Once saved, always saved. Because Calvinism is a theological system, it is necessary to note that like most theological systems, it has what is called a regulatory principle. And by this I mean a regulatory principle is the one doctrine or the one statement about God that trumps all other ones. And you build the entire system around this one solid core. For Calvinism, that solid core is this. God is sovereign. He is ruler. He is 100% powerful, 
he is never, ever thwarted. And this will be Calvin's basic starting point. That God is in 100% control of everything at every level, including the human decision to actually seek after God, repent, and become saved. From start to finish, God is behind every action, including human salvation. Now, it, will, it should be noted here that this regulatory principle almost forces Calvin to end up where he ends up. Now, other systematic theologians will tend to suggest a different regulating principle, like the love of God, or the holiness of God. And in class, I pointed out that a Restoration Movement theologian named Jack Cottrell, when he wrote his, um, his systematic theology, his regulatory principle is the holiness of God. Now, this allowed for Cottrell to wind up in a very different place than Calvin. Even though he follows the same basic framework that Calvin did. He starts with God as creator and works all the way through to what does the Bible say about Christ? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? What is, and he follows the same basic framework as Calvin. But because his regulating principle is the holiness of God, and not the sovereignty of God, he makes very, very different conclusions about how salvation works. Especially, he makes some very, what are known as Arminian choices about what human free will is like. Because you notice in Calvin's system, if God is 100% ruler, then that means humanity is 100% not ruling anything. Because God, in fact, is doing everything. And so, but if you have the, as Cottrell suggests, the holiness of God as a regulating principle, all of a sudden you start to see that there's a lot of different possibilities. God, as a holy God, must punish evil, but he can't touch evil. You see, if God, in Calvin's system, if God is sovereign, he actually can touch evil. He can actually manipulate evil. In some situations, you could even say he causes evil. And you know what? That's to his glory. In Cottrell's principle, the holiness of God is, its most, is the most regulating principle. Because of that, God can't touch that which is evil. God won't deal with that which is evil. And so one of the one of the things that this results in is that we have to understand human election in terms where God is not responsible for evil. And if I could sum up the difference between what is known as Calvinism and its opposite, Arminianism, it is this. The Calvinistic principle based on sovereignty leads God to being the direct cause of evil. In other Arminian reconstructions, God is never the cause of evil. It is always a secondary agent, Satan or human free will. But whatever the case, God has not touched it. He has not dabbled in it. He is not pulling strings, as it were. And just to kind of f follow up on that, because of this focus on sovereignty, a question comes up, well then, why do some people get saved and other people go to hell? For Calvin, he is going to say, there are three things about predestination that God will, before a person is ever born, destine them to go to either heaven or hell. And he says three things about predestination. The first is that predestination is absolute. And by this, 
it is not dependent on other contingencies. This person will be saved unless he does this. This person will be saved as long as he refrains from doing this, or he. this person will be saved as long as he does this. No. In Calvin's system, predestination is absolute. If God picked you, God picked you. It is totally up to God's will and not based on anything a human being has done. Now, his second point on this is that predestination is particular. And that means that each individual human being is picked individually. It's not like God says, hey, I kind of like everyone in the in the country of Germany in the year 1808. So everyone in Germany in 1808 picked. No, it's particular. God goes through every human being who will ever lived and says, this one goes to heaven or this one goes to hell. And he is p- picking based on the individual. And finally, he's going to say that God's predestination is double. And by that he means he is picking both the people who go to heaven and he's picking the people who will go to hell. That a double predestination is always this person goes one place or the other. That is what he means by double. You have two choices, heaven or hell. And in Calvin's system, God is picking both. Now, in addition to Calvin's theology, we also have to deal with the fact that Calvin was a reformer who was invited to a specific city in Switzerland to do his work. The city is known as Geneva. And it's going to entangle Calvin not just in theological reforms, but in government and moral reforms. And it's going to lead Calvin to have to deal with a very difficult issue. Well, we already looked at predestination, and we know that certain people are picked to go to heaven and certain people aren't in Calvin's system. But then the question goes, well, can you control the people that aren't? Meaning that if they're going to be evil, totally depraved, and they're not going to seek after God because God hasn't picked them. Well, what do you do with those people? Because totally depraved people cause all kinds of problems. And so Calvin is going to basically state that in a Christian city, the saved or the elect should govern the city and they should force the non-elect to obey God's moral law. And they should punish God's mor- they should, they, uh, sorry, and they should punish the people who break God's moral law severely. In short, Calvin's Geneva is going to become a church state. The elect are going to be in government positions, with Calvin being pretty much the top dog throughout his life. And Calvin is going to enforce God's law on the people, whether they're elect or not. Now, one of the more famous incidents is going to be when a certain man flees from Spain. This, uh, This uh, man is uh, known as uh, Michael Servetus. Now, Servetus is going to be a very, very smart individual. One of the things Servetus is known for is discovering how the heart pumps blood through the system. He is the first person to suggest this microscopic thing called a capillary. Well... Servetus was no dummy, and the reason I bring this up is because Servetus, in reading his scriptures, is going to come to a very non-Orthodox conclusion. Servetus is going to deny the Trinity. He's going to be a non-Trinitarian. Well, Servetus lives in Spain, one of the most Roman Catholic countries in the world at the time. 
And this is not going to fly well with the Spanish authorities, particularly Queen Isabel. And so he is going to run for his life across the Spanish border up into France, and eventually he's going to make his way to Geneva. And he's specifically going to ask Calvin to protect him. Well, Calvin will have none of this because to deny the Trinity, as far as Calvin is concerned, is to break God's law in the most sickening and reprobate way possible. Now, again, on this side of the argument, many of us would say, but Calvin, he can't make that choice. He's a heretic. Yeah, true, but he's totally depraved. What did you expect? Did you expect him to just believe you? To believe the church fathers? But Calvin will have Servetus put to death. And I bring up this entire part just to say that in Calvinistic states, places like the Presbyterian Church, which will generate many, um, many uh, of our New England settlers, and Puritans, who are also Calvinistic, will found uh, what is known as the Massachusetts Bay Colony in particular. Keep in mind that they are taking all of their church-state policies directly from Calvin. They're going to see Calvin's rule over Geneva, and they're going to say, this is the greatest thing ever, the church controlling the government. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to see where this could get very abused. And many times since Calvin, there will be people, both with good intentions and the megalomaniac, as it were, who will use this system to control people, to persecute non-believers. And in general, one of the reactions to this is this church-state policy will leave a very bad and bitter taste in most people's mouths. And this will be important because when we start to get to the birth of the Restoration Movement in the early 1800s, Thomas Jefferson, the will be the third president of the United States in 1800. And Jefferson will be one of the bigger advocates for interpreting America's Constitution and the First Amendment that this is to be a separation between church and state. And part of the reason he wants this to be so is he wants to keep the Calvinistic Geneva church-state paradigm from becoming a reality in the American nation as at large. And he, he also would like to keep it from happening in just the states in general. But let's shift gears here for a second because I really want to stress this point that Calvinism is a development. That John Calvin was always thinking this thing through. And by the time we get to the Restoration Movement in the late 1700s, early 1800s, what will be called Calvinism is really only about 80% John Calvin. And what I mean by this is that John Calvin will develop Calvinism all the way up until he dies. But after Calvin's death, many other reformers will take his ideas and try to draw them out to logical conclusions. And because of this, what will be known as Calvinism during the late 1700s, early 1800s, is actually going to be somewhat significantly different from the Calvinism, as John Calvin himself put it in his Institutes of Christian Religion. So one of the biggest differences between pre-Calvin Calvinism 
and post-Calvin Calvinism is this doctrine known as superlapsarianism. Now, this is a billion dollar word that you're probably only going to hear in this class and probably a few theology classes and that's it. But the doctrine of superlapsarianism is the doctrine that says that God chose human beings to fall before he ever created them. That even Adam and Eve's choice in the garden was a foregone conclusion that God had already chosen for them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before he ever decided to create them. Now, many historians will note that Calvin never actually enunciates this doctrine. It will be his protege and good friend Theodore Beza who will articulate this doctrine. And so, keep in mind that this specific doctrine of superlapse Arianism will be one of the things that, during the late 1700s, early 1800s, many groups, whether Calvinistic or not, will really start to rethink this doctrine. Because, again, if superlapse Arianism is true, God destined evil. He picked it. It's his plan. And that really makes God seem, well, kind of like a jerk. Kind of like, well, if you went through the kind of middle school I did, kind of like when the bully at the bus stop grabs your hand and starts slapping your face with it and says, why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? In many ways, that is how people in the 1700s and 1800s are going to start seeing this doctrine of superlapse and superlapse Arianism. That God has picked Adam to be sinful and then spends the rest of the Bible asking humanity, why are you being so evil? Well, this idea will not fly with anyone in the Restoration Movement that I've read. Now, kind of shifting gears here, Another doctrine that is going to go through kind of a metamorphosis is going to be the actual doctrine of predestination itself. Now, when Calvin produced his Institutes of the Christian Religion, we find the doctrine of predestination described in Book 3. Theodore Beza, when he starts editing and revising the Institutes, Many historians note that he moves the doctrine of predestination back into book one. Back when we are starting to first describe who is God and what does he do. And many will go so far to say that because of Theodore Beza's influence, the doctrine of predestination will become the nerve center of Calvinism. And by this they mean when Calvin puts it in his version, it's really kind of far down the list of things he wants to talk about. When Theodore Beza puts it in, it's right up there near the top. Because predestination is something God does before he even creates. Therefore, it needs to go before we even talk about creation. So, logically speaking, Theodore Beza probably does put the doctrine in the right place, if superlapsinarianism is true. But it's very interesting that this, even the subtle placement of this doctrine, changes in many ways how important the, doctor it, the doctrine is, and others will certainly follow suit. To this, I'd like to add that eventually Calvinism begins being exported. And the biggest reason it's going to get exported is because of what is known as the Marian Exile in England. Many of the Puritans and uh, Reformers in England, when Mary Tudor, the daughter of Henry VIII, when she becomes queen, that she will try to bring Catholicism back to England. And many of the Protestants will flee England. And they'll go to Geneva.
And so what will happen, these English Puritans will go to Geneva, they'll see how tight of a ship Calvin runs, and say, this is great. Eventually, they'll take Calvin's ideas back home with him once Mary dies. Now, back in England, other reformers who have been influenced by Calvin will start to tack on ideas as well, and they'll add their own doctrines that will become, for the most part, essential to Calvinism as well. One is an idea suggested by John Knox, and he's basically going to ask the question, okay, if God has elected people, how do I identify them? What are the earmarks of God's elect? And Knox will really simplify what the Institute's has to say about that and really bring it down to two basic things. One, he's going to say that there is a moral test, that a person who has been elected by God will lead a holy and moral life. Now, I'd also like to keep in mind that the person themselves is not the arbitrator of whether or not they are leading a holy and moral life. Because that is the church's job to tell you, are you leading a holy life or not? And because the church in a lot of these Calvinistic countries will be wrapped up in the state, a person may not only, may not only receive you know, church discipline for leading a less than holy life, they may also receive governmental discipline incarceration, punishment, and maybe even death. And so, but the big thing to keep in mind, the moral life is always judged by the church in a strongly Calvinistic worldview. Now, a second test is going to be there, and this one will be an experiential test that a believer will have a profound, life-changing experience that will confirm that they are a member of the elect. Basically, this will focus on the fact that they should be experiencing irresistible grace. And anytime you experience something irresistible, it is profound, it drags you, it pulls you, it basically yanks you into grace. And this process should produce something that basically shatters your world. And this is the second test they're going to have, is that a regenerate believer should have a pretty awesome conversion story. Now again, the believer is not the arbitrator of whether or not it's a good conversion story. It is the church who will decide who's got the good story and who doesn't. But you notice in both of these cases, we have men judging other men as to whether or not they are among the elect. Both in the, yeah, you're leading a holy life, and the, yes, you have a profound life-changing story. Both of those things come down to what does a man see? Well, anyone familiar with their scriptures would know that one of the more famous passages is that man looks at the outward appearance. God and God alone sees the heart. Well, this will cause all kinds of difficulties as people living in America and living under the freshly minted democratic ideals of the Constitution will start to say, well, who are you to decide whether I'm living a moral life? And who are you to decide that my story counts as a conversion story? And so, this idea is really going to be almost dismissed out of hand by the time we get to the seven, late 1700s, because people are not going to allow the church, in many ways, to dictate what counts as a acceptable experience. 
So all of this is to say that by the 1700s, many, many people will be rethinking Calvinism. And part of what's going to cause them to rethink it is Calvinism just won't be popular. That it will be strong in New England, but New England will have this idea of what is known as covenant theology, which means that if you are going to be a part of the elect, one of your parents already had to be one of the elect. Well, this is a diminishing returns pyramid for certain. And so by the 1700s, we're going to start seeing many, many of these churches basically say, we only have a very small pool of people who can even be elected. Again, taken to its logical conclusions, a lot of Calvinism really shuts the door to people having conversion experiences. So, this is going to cause Calvinism to really start to go into a decline by the late 1700s. Now, another thing to kind of keep in mind is that as they start rethinking this, several of these doctrines that we looked at, particularly superlapsinarianism, are going to really kind of be softened. It's not that they're going to be denied, but that we're going to start thinking about them in ways that, well, it may exist, but it's really not that bad. And one of the biggest advocates of this is going to be a Massachusetts reformer named Jonathan Edwards. But before we can talk about Edwards, we really also should bring up another person in tandem with him. And that is this, well, let's be honest, this funny looking gentleman named George Whitfield. George Whitfield is probably the premier preacher of the mid 1700s. Uh, in fact, his preaching revivals will be so successful that they will dub this revival the first great awakening in America. Now, Whitfield is going to do some interesting things for a Calvinist. Now, keep in mind, Whitfield is a very strong Calvinist. And Whitfield is going to preach the gospel to people. He is going to make it his goal to go out and evangelize and preach. And when he preaches to people, he is going to make an offer, a basically an altar call at the end of his preaching, basically asking people to accept Christ and be saved. Now, a strong Calvinist would say, now wait a second, George Whitfield, they can't accept Christ. There's no way for a person who is totally depraved can hear your message and respond to it. And so what's going to happen is George Whitfield will be highly successful in his preaching revivals. And many of the old guard Calvinism particularly Presbyterians who will call themselves the old light Presbyterians, will basically say, this, this is nonsense what George Whitfield is preaching. And so Edwards, the man we looked at before, will put his pen to work and basically craft a revised Calvinistic theology that allows for preaching the gospel, and asking for conversion. And largely, it's going to focus on the idea of irresistible grace, that part of Whitfield's message is, I'm going to tug at your heartstrings and encourage you to let the gospel sink in at the emotional level. Edwards will largely look at 
this emotional reaction and tie it to the the irresistible grace part of the tulip equation and say that tug in your heart as Whitfield is preaching is the irresistible grace and so what's going to happen is Calvinism will in the wake of these revivals get a facelift and they will call these the new measures and there's going to be two major ones one of the new measures is that preaching should appeal to the conscience and it should ask for a conversion decision. Now, the other new measure is somewhat similar. It says that preaching should appeal to the emotions and try to provoke a mystical experience. Basically, we should, by our preaching, create moments of irresistible grace. Now, what this effectively does is it will put Calvinism and its reverse uh, theology, the Arminian theology, on equal playing terms because both will assume that if we preach a human being will respond. So let's try to tie all this off in a nice pretty bow here. So what are some of the pros of Calvinism? Well, first I'd like to suggest that one of the major selling points of Calvinism is that while it's a huge theological system, it's pretty cumbersome, it is logically consistent and it can explain the problem of evil rather well. Why is there evil in the world? Because God predestined it to exist. You got a problem? Take it up with God. And you know what? You're going to lose. May not be emotionally satisfying to some, but you know what? It's logically consistent. And in a world where a lot of theological systems have logical inconsistencies. This one is nice, tight, and compact on that issue. Now, a second pro of Calvinism is that when Protestantism got going, it didn't have what Roman Catholicism had, a systematic theology. Particularly, Roman Catholicism was running on about 300 years of a very important systematic theology called Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologia. This is a huge, huge book in itself. And Protestants simply don't have a well-articulated systematic theology. After Calvin, they will. And in many ways, this will be the Protestant go-to guide for reading and interpreting what a lot of scriptural doctrines mean. And another pro to this idea is that it will offer a very precise call for the church to control morality in a governed population. That the church should still step in to the state function. And for early America, this will be very, very important, and especially in New England, where the Puritans are going to try to create a church state that runs in harmony with God's law. And even today, we hear many, many conservative groups basically saying, America should go back to having more laws based on the Bible. Well, many of these ideas that are still with us today really come from Calvin's call for Christianity to be up close and personal with the governances of a country or city. Now, there are a couple cons, and I'd really like to focus that these cons will become major points of division for many of our Restoration Movement 
fathers. Now, the first one is that the Calvinistic system does not mesh with the human experience that our personal choices feel real. Here's what I mean by that. That a person, when they experience something, doesn't think, oh, God is moving me. Right now, I'm wiggling my toe, and I'm not thinking, God is making me wiggle my toe. I'm thinking, I am making my toe wiggle. Now, with that in mind, let's take what we looked at in our previous set of lectures on American democracy. If people start to have this idea that we're in control of our political destiny, we can now vote for who's going to be president. We can now vote whether or not the state we live in will be a part of the union. That will come with this idea that personal choice is real and that the individual choice is powerful. And Calvinism will always conflict with this American ideal that human choice feels very real. Now, another con, and we're going to see this played out in the 16 and 1700s, is that the Calvinistic system does not give a very good reason to evangelize. After all, God will pick the elect unconditionally. It's not like my preaching, my ministry, or anything that I do will help to make a condition to make more people suddenly become elected. And so... The idea of revivalism makes very little sense in a very strong Calvinistic world. And so many people in America, particularly the Jonathan Edwards and the George Whitfields, will really have to soften or just downright ignore the doctrine of total depravity in order to make evangelism a real thing for their church. And now, finally, I'd also like to point out that a church control over the morality of a people can be very easily abused. And by the turn of the 1800s, we're going to see many people basically saying, we are sick and tired of the church telling us what to do. We can read the Bible for ourselves, find out what is moral, and doggone it, we're going to do it on our own. And so, in many ways, the Calvinistic system does not mesh with American democracy. And this is largely what Nathan Hatch, the historian out of Yale, is going to argue very vehemently, that as Calvinism declines and democracy rises, American Christianity will go through a democratization process. And it's largely based on these cons that I have listed here. So after the Civil or sorry, so after the American Revolutionary War, we're going to see a backlash against Calvinism. Now, here's just some statistics that we'll deal with a little bit later, but just keep some of these numbers in your head. In America, Calvinism will be strong before the American Revolution. It's estimated that before the Revolution, 85% of the Christians in America are Calvinist. Now, between 1776 and 1850, this estimate will drop to less than 50%. Okay, now there's going to be a second part to this backlash. And that is that Calvinism will come into direct conflict with the American interpretive idea that certain truths are self-evident. Americans will begin to view themselves as the masters of their own fate, politically. And they will start to say, and it's also self-evident, 
that we are masters of our spiritual fate as well. We can choose God of our own accord. And because of this, the fastest growing denomination during this period, 1776 to 1850, is going to be the Methodists. And these are going to be a very Arminian group. They are going to say, of course human beings have a free will choice. And you can choose to follow God freely if you want. And so I'd like to conclude with one of my favorite uh, comic strips. This is a comic strip called Coffee with Jesus, done by a group called Radio Free Babylon. And in this, we have um, a situation where Joe, a minister, is talking with Jesus. And Joe basically asks Jesus, he says, I've got this couple in my church, Jesus, and they're separating due to some, well, infidelity. Jesus responds, well, 30 minutes of pleasure followed by 30 years of complications, Joe. I've seen it 30 million times. Joe's going to fire back. He's going to say, couldn't we have stopped it? All of these damaged lives. It's such a waste. Jesus then quips, in these situations, Joe, people tend to tune out the loudest warnings. And puppetry isn't my thing. This, I think, really encapsulates the question of Calvinism. Is God a puppeter? Does he control humanity like a puppet? Now, obviously, Radio Free Babylon feels that God, in fact, doesn't do puppetry. But one of the big questions to ask is, does he, in fact, control humanity? And if so, how much does he exert that influence? In the Restoration Movement, they are going to historically say, God does not exert a Calvinistic level of control. Now, in many ways, they're not going to be fully Arminian either. But I'd just like to kind of just set the stage right now that the movement we're going to look at, known as the Smith-Jones movement, that they are going to vehemently deny Calvinism. And we're going to connect that with William Guyrie from the O'Kelly Christians in Virginia, and that we're going to see that one of his deciding factors on whether or not to pursue Christian unity with the Smith-Jones Christians is going to be Calvinism.